All right, away we go, like Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You're not recording yet, are you? I am. Oh, <laughs> so We're so happy to see Mike, Mike Dahl. Everyone, did everyone meet Mike Dahl here today? No, I didn't. Yeah, yeah he's related, sitting right? here. Did you see him? He's sitting here in the front. Huh? Is it related to Frank Dahl? You have no, I don't know. There's a lot of dolls I've because learned. that's my brother-in-law's name. But anyway, so Daniel's little horn, what I've been waiting for, to me, things start becoming much, a little bit more, well, a little bit more interesting. We go through some boring stuff here, but then uh, we get into this little horn power that the Bible prophesied through Daniel, the writer of the book of Daniel and in Revelation. Um, who wrote the book of Revelation? Does does anyone remember? John. John. John the Revelator. Is that the same guy that wrote one of the Gospels? John that wrote. Um, the, John. And then first, second, third John. Oh, and first, second, third John. Yeah, I forgot. John's a pretty popular guy. Yeah, he is. And uh, and he was the most loved disciple. That's that. Well, that, by, by his point of view, from who was the most loved? Who was the most loved? Oh, I don't know. I think Judas was loved just as much as any of the other ones. They all died a violent death, though, didn't they? Except for John. Well, well. He, he died in. But he was wasn't he cooked in oil or something well, like that? And they, gosh. Jeez, talk about a barbecue. <laughs> And we're talking about this today. Oh, gosh. Anyway, should we start with the word of prayer? Heavenly Father, uh, we're thankful to be back together again after a couple weeks. And um, I'm so thankful for the ones that are here today and the one that couldn't make it. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you'd watch over her and be with her today. And um, I pray for each one that is here, that you would give them the ears to hear what you would want us to know today, and to help us to learn more about you, and to learn more about what the Bible says, and most of all, Lord, help us and guide us and lead us into truth. None of us wants to believe lies, at least I sure don't want to believe any lies. Um, we want to live by truth and walk in your truth. And I pray for all these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right. So, Daniel's little horn. And just a little bit of a review. Um, I want to bring up Revelation, was it Revelation 7? and Or 17. 17, 1 through 6. We had this a couple of weeks ago. Um, it says, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bulls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, when it's saying, saying to me, this is John speaking that we just spoke about, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. Kind of interesting reading about this in the Bible, this great harlot who sits on many waters. We read that a couple or a few weeks ago. Um, many waters, we're going to find out, represents... Does, huh? Nations. People, many people. Um, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. Hmm. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Very strong language here. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman. Does anyone know what a woman represents here? What, what is this talking about, this woman? In prophecy, the woman represents the church. It's talking about the church. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Interesting, a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. 
kind of interesting again, a lot of um, imagery here, um, kind of a different way of describing this, having seven heads, this beast had seven heads and ten horns in it. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. Um, yeah, it's not speaking very good about this church, this woman, is it? No. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. Now we were learning about physical Babylon in Daniel's time. The first kingdom, the head of gold, was the Babylonian kingdom. Revelation is talking about the end time Babylon, a spiritual Babylon. That both were not Christian, good, godly kingdoms. They were pagan kingdoms. And so it's kind of talking about this adulterous paganism church, Misty Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth. Verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement says, I saw the woman, I saw this church drunk with the blood of the and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. This church, this antichrist power is what we're going to learn about today in a long, drawn-out way. <laughs> so, starting in the lesson here, I'm going to start reading there at the top. Not in the blue part, but in the white part is the blue part will save till later. Lesson 7. We discovered that the book of Revelation predicted the rise of a modern spiritual Babylon that would do some of the same things that ancient Babylon did. Spiritual Babylon would mix paganism with the worship of God and would persecute God's people who would refuse to accept this combination of paganism and Christianity. Since the Bible has foretold that a false religious system would arise, every sincere Christian should make certain that he tests every religious movement by the Bible and the Bible only. Solas Scripture, the Bible only. We cannot afford to trust what religious leaders may say, what well-meaning individuals may say, but we can trust the Word of God only. Remember that the Revelation indicates that there are many God-fearing people in Babylon. To them, God sends a message. Come out of her, my people. It is God's people who are called out of Babylon in this lesson. We will be dealing with a very sensitive, yet important and crucial subject. We will let the Bible identify for us this great apostate system that has mixed paganism and Christianity together. Some who study this lesson may be hurt by learning this identity. Please remember, there is no malice intended to anyone belonging to any religious system. God is not speaking about individuals, but this system itself. God loves every individual who may have become entangled in false teachings. In love, he sends them the message to come out of Babylon. It is only because of God's great love and concern for us that he has warned us so explicitly about religious systems. God does not want us to be deceived. Truth can be painful at times, but deception is even more painful in the end. With eternity at stake, our only safety is to rely not on what man says, but on what God says in his holy word, the Bible. You know, kind of interesting throughout history. You know, whether we like it a lot, like it or not, many times we become a lot like our parents, don't we? Kind of. Yet we try to. I mean, I think I had really good parents. Certainly not perfect by any means, 
but good parents, but I see a lot of crummy parents out there in this world. Mm -hmm. They're not watching their kids, they're not training their kids. They throw them into school and say, here, you train them what to think and what to say, and that can be a scary thing also. Because you don't know what your teacher is teaching them. You know, your, te your teacher might be an atheist and teaching them, you know, evolutionary things. We hear about that a lot in our public schools. The teaching of evolution, not creationism. Not that there is a God, that there is no God. You know, so we have to be careful. Sometimes we follow traditions of what we were raised with. This is what I was raised with, and so this is what I believe, and this is what I'm going to. Well, no, what this is saying is follow the Bible. Let's follow the Bible only and check it out. If you're going to church and the pastor is saying this, or what I'm saying here, you should check it out. Is this the truth? Is this really the truth? Because there's a lot of people, that, a lot of religious people that teach contrary to a, a, a number of things that these lessons are going to teach us. So we we got to be careful to walk in the truth. You know, it's kind of interesting. There was this family that they would always get together for Easter and they would have a ham for Easter. And the lady, the young lady, it was, you know, she was just newly married and the young, so they had it, this celebration at, at her home. And so she was about ready to cook this ham and she cut the end of the ham off and put it in the pan. And there was a friend there that said, oh, she says, why did you cut the end of the ham off? And she says, well, that's what my mom always did. She said, oh, that's interesting. Do you know, why did your mom do that? And she says, I don't know, my mom's here. She says, let's ask her why. Mom, so mom came into the kitchen there, why did you always cut the ham off, or cut the end of the ham off before you bake the ham? And she says, I don't know. She said, that's what my mom always did. I was like, oh, grandma would cut the end of the ham off before she cooked the ham. And she said, well, this was kind of driving them crazy. It's like, well, you know, this friend, why did you cut the end of the ham off? That doesn't make any sense. And she said, well, Grandma was in the nursing home. And so it's like, oh, you know what? Let's call Grandma up and see why she cut the end of the ham off. And so they called Grandma up and it's like, Grandma, why did you cut the end of the ham off before you cooked the ham? And she said, because it didn't fit in the pan that way. <laughs> so sometimes we do things in a tradition, traditionally, we do it over and over, we don't even know why we do them. And it's like, why are we doing them? And that's why we're trying to figure out why, if, if, if I was raised in a Christian home, why am I Christian? Why did I believe in this Jesus that died on the cross and rose again? Why do I believe in God? Why am I not, you know, what's popular around here is shaman. Why don't I practice shaman like the rest? Um, I, was, I was, you know, of course there's a number of shaman or, or people that follow shaman beliefs spiritual beliefs, but why, why are they doing what they're doing? And it's kind of interesting because, to be honest, there's a lot of similarities between Christian and shaman. There's, you know, we believe there's, at least I certainly believe that there's evil or wicked spirits out there, right? Devils and demons. Does everyone believe in the devil? I believe in the devil. I believe he's strong and powerful and um, wanting to seek us out, and, and shaman believe in spiritual things like that. It's a little bit, but there is differences. Um, and I think a lot of these things derived from Judeo-Christian beliefs, or the Jewish people, it's just that they strayed off in different directions. All of a sudden, the Muslim faith popped up here, and, and shaman faith, or whatever, but but it was a deception, I believe. So anyway, moving forward. Uh, in the lion's den. So starting out with number one there. And how many beasts did Daniel see coming out out of the sea? Daniel 7, 1 through 3. Jen, you want to read that? In the first year 
year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. <laughs> All right, so how many beasts did Daniel see coming up out of the sea? Four, four, four beasts. So this is going to be very similar to um, what we learned in Daniel 2. Instead of a statue with all the, the powers, this is going to um, kind of overlap. It's kind of talking about the same things now. He saw four beasts coming up out of the sea, the sea being the people. Number two, what does the sea represent? Well, what I just told you, I guess. Revelation 17, 15. It said to me, the waters which you see, saw where the harlot sits, there again, there's that harlot, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So the, the, the waters, the many waters, represent peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Basically, it could be all summed up, and it, it means people, <laughs> many people. Number three, what do the four beasts represent? Represent Daniel 17, or Daniel 7, verse 17 and 23. Justin, you want to read that? Those great beasts, which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it in. All right, so we've learned this from previous lessons. What do the four beasts represent? Kings and kingdoms. In Daniel 2, four kingdoms are represented by various metals of great image. The head of gold, if you remember, was Babylon. The breast and arms of silver, that was Medo-Persia. The belly and thighs of brass. Um, was Greece. Greece took over Medo-Persia, conquered Medo-Persia. The legs of iron were Rome. The feet, part of iron and part of clay, were the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. Daniel 7 builds on what Daniel 2 has revealed, using different symbols to portray the same four world empires and adding details about the behavior of each of these powers. A new power... <laughs> The little horn is introduced in Daniel 7. What did God choose to represent the kingdom of Babylon? So Daniel 7, verse 4. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I watched till its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man, and a man's heart was given to it. So there again, uh, so the answer to that is what beast did God choose to represent the kingdom of Babylon? It was the lion. Is the lion known as the king of the beast, right? Yeah. And so the lion um, represented Babylon, which was the greatest kingdom, Daniel said, and that was the same as the head of gold in Daniel 2. Interesting. Yep. Just as all the choices of metals was chosen to represent Babylon, so the king of the beast, the lion, represents Babylon in Daniel. Number five, the prophecy begins where the prophet is living. Since Daniel lived in ancient Babylon, it is logical to begin the prophecy with Babylon. What am animal <laughs> represents the second world empire of Medo-Persia? Daniel 7, verse 5. And suddenly another beast, a second like a bear, it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. And they said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. Kind of interesting. The second beast, another powerful beast, is the bear. That's the answer to the next question. Um, it represented Medo-Persia. And what did it say in that verse? It said the one side... Can you back up there? Was raised up. 
And I think, what was it, the Medes were more powerful than the Persians back then, if I remember right? Um, it had three ribs in its mouth. I didn't write it down, I can't remember what the three ribs represent. I was thinking it was generals, but um, I'm not sure about that. I wish I would have wrote it down because I, I heard... It had three what in its mouth? Ribs. Oh. Number six, what animal represents the third kingdom? The Grecian kingdom. Daniel 7, verse 6. Jen, read that. That's interesting. A leopard represents the Greece, Greece, Grecian. Can I say Grecian Empire? Is that how I say that? Um, which was a very swift empire. Um, the head, Alexander the Great, was the, the leader of Greece. And um, at a very young age, very swift, yes. Mike Sharp. Did they call him Alexander the Great back then, or is that what he got named later on? I don't know. Some reason I want to know that. Why? I mean, uh, maybe you have already said this um, once, but, but why is the Bible so heavily reliant upon metaphors? Metaphors and imagery and stuff like that? That's a great question. Um, you know, the way I see it, is, you know, the Bible says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. I think if God made everything just plain as day and said, oh, this is, you know, the Antichrist, this is the devil and whatever, and, and the devil and God were paraded before us, I don't know. There's also you know, a free will or whatever, and maybe God wanted it to be more interesting to us. You know, it's just like, okay, it's kind of like doing a puzzle, you know, <laughs> putting the pieces together. And once you get all the pieces together, it's like, that looks really cool. You know, it kind of sucks when there's two or three pieces missing, doesn't it? Doesn't that really bother you? That OCD comes out in all of us, right? It's just like, ah. Oh! What can we do about that missing piece, you know? And it's like, you know, in my world, there's many, many pieces missing, you know? <laughs> but we're trying to put all the pieces together and figure out, you know? God is so much higher than us. Did you want to comment on that? Oh, one of the, I can't remember where in the Bible, but it says, if you seek me with all your heart, you'll find me. And so it's people who actively want to search this out and understand it, who are showing their commitment to God, not just people, oh yeah, I read it, whatever, yeah, interesting story. He wants, even in Revelation, beginning of Revelation, it says, those who listen and understand and do what the book says. So you have to search it out and see what is the intent, what is the meaning, mm -hmm. so that you fully understand it, so then you can then do it. Also, with the bear, um, it's uh, from from very long time ago. It's meant to um, understand that it was three nations that were conquered by the Medo-Persian Empire, the Babylonian. Well, and, and it's kind of interesting because I, for whatever reason, I, I don't desire to read the Bible. I just don't. I, I mean, I do to try to look for answers for things and stuff like that, but it's not exciting to me. It's not fun. And obviously, most people don't read the Bible. <laughs> they don't find it interesting or intriguing or whatever. If they do, they don't read it, read it like a regular book from start to finish. They jump around or... Well, that's what I do all the time. You know? It's supposed to be read just like any book. Right. And, and I think that's good. We should do that. 
Um, but, I mean, I've read the New Testament a number of times, you know, the Gospels and stuff like that. But, boy, it's, it's, it's not easy. But a lot of times I'm just reading to try to find answers to things, you know. Not like it's uh, when you can't sit down. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You know, I watched that movie uh, here uh, like a week ago or a week and a half ago, Mercy Me. Mm-hmm. Oh. Or I Can Only Imagine, I think it's uh, Yeah. That's a beautiful movie, by the way. Yeah. But when when um, he starts, when he realizes his dad's dying and they start getting along, or right before that, you know, when he comes home to try to, you know, work things out, he sits down and his dad, you know, tells him he's trying to change and he's read the Bible and he doesn't understand it. And, and then his son goes, well, which parts? He goes, well, I've read all of it, you know, or all of it. And uh, and then um, they fight, and you know he goes out to the truck and sees that pancreatic cancer thing, and comes back in, and you know, then he says, "Oh, geez, you, you know that." It's, uh, I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with the question I asked, but that was just a really beautiful moment. And you know, the son forgiving the father, and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, it is a good movie. Highly recommended, huh? Okay, so how many heads did the leopard have? Four. Four. The four heads of the leopard represent the four divisions of the Grecian Empire at the death of Alexander the Great. Rather than one power taking over, the kingdom was divided among his four generals. Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, Seleucus, who ruled over the kingdoms of Macedonia, how do you pronounce that? Is it Thrace? Trace? Is it Trace or Thrace? Thrace. Thrace? Egypt and Syria. Number eight, the fourth beast represented pagan Rome is identifying by having what kind of teeth? Daniel 7.7. 7. Jan, you want to read that? The fourth, beast re- rep- the fourth beast representing pagan Rome is identified by having what kind of teeth? They were iron teeth. So very similar again to the statue of Daniel 2. Just kind of a different way of looking at this, I guess. Um, instead of iron legs, it had iron teeth. Note the similarity between the legs of iron in Daniel 2 and the iron teeth in Daniel 7, indicating that both the beast and the legs representing the iron monarchy are um, monarchy of Rome. How many horns did the fourth beast have? Daniel 7, 7. Justin, want to read that? So this Roman Empire during Jesus' time, that's who was ruling. How did Jesus die? He was crucified. He had nails pounded in his hands and feet and put a a crown of thorns on him. So um, this Roman Empire didn't mess around. (laughs) But a lot of those ancient, you know, the same thing, throw them into the lion's den and let them rip them apart, you know, so... I guess they were all kind of barbaric type people back then. Um, the ten horns represent the ten div- divisions of the Roman Empire for their identity. See lesson four. So we can go back to review that. Um, but and then too, there were ten horns, which is kind of interesting because back then there were many barbaric tribes in the Roman Empire. A lot of different, many more than ten. Um, but it kind of came down to where they warred and fought each other and this and that, and then it came down to just 10. I think it was in, maybe it tells us a little bit later on, in 576 A.D. or whatever, um, 
just 10 and then we'll find out that three were plucked out. Um, number 10, what did Daniel see arising in the midst of the 10 horns? Daniel 7 verse 8. You want to read that, Justin? I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the root. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. So this is interesting. See on the picture there, there's that little horn on there that has a mouth on it with eyes on it. Kind of weird, but, it, but these horns represent kingdoms. So this, this kingdom, um, well, I'll just read there. Here's a power not mentioned in Daniel 2. Daniel's description of the work of the little horn is a new area not mentioned before. Let us now discover the identifying marks of the little horn. <clears throat> so the answer to that yeah, question, what did Daniel see arising in the midst of the ten? The little horn. The little horn. Oh, did I go over that already? Didn't I? No? Oh, okay. I missed that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the little horn rises up out of those ten horns. So just remember, these ten horns are these ten divisions of Western Europe, right? Or what we know as Europe now in Western Europe. Ten different countries. A lot of those were, you know, like France and Italy and all those countries like that. So... Um, this horn rises up out of there and it has a person speaking things um, like a king or something like that, right? So, um, number 11. So are we going to read that whole part then? From Daniel 8? Yeah, from Daniel 8. Okay. So, Reading from Daniel 7, starting verse, verse 8. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was as white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Do, you know, do we know who that's talking about that, there? We just kind of switched it up a little bit. He was watching until thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. That would be God, right? Jesus. Um, verse 10, a fiery stream ish, issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated and the books were open. It's talking about um, probably the millennial reign, which we'll talk about later on. I watched him because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched, now we're talking about that little horn again, the words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So all these powers that were in power at one time are no longer. This is after this world is done with. <laughs> Verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory in the kingdom, that all peoples, nations, and languages would serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. There again, it's talking about Jesus and how he's going to be the ruler of every, every king and kingdom. <laughs> and then it says, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four, are four kings which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. 
So we're kind of going back and forth. We're talking about Jesus' end time kingdom and this little horn power. Next. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast, which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured broken pieces and trampled the residue with its feet, and the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely that horn which had eyes and a mouth which spoke pompous words, whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching, and the same horn was making war, making war against the saints and prevailing against them. We're talking about the little horn power here. Until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. Now this is at the end. So it's going, kind of going back and forth, back and forth there. Talking about the little horn power and the end when Jesus is the king and the ruler of everything. Number, verse 23, Thus he said, The fourth beast shall be a fourth kingdom on earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, trample it, and break it into pieces. Talking about the Roman Empire there. Then the ten horns are ten kings who shall arise from the kingdom, and another shall rise after them. He shall be different from the first ones and shall subdue three kings. Talking about the little horn power again. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. We're going to talk about that time and times and half a time, what that means. But the court shall be seated, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to des destroy it forever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the, whole, under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an, is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Talking about God's kingdom. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. So if you're just reading through that, normal person reading the Bible for the first time or whatever, they're going to go, what in the world does this all mean? It's kind of hard to understand. It goes back and forth, back and forth, talking about the end time kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, and this little horn power that's contrary to God's kingdom. All right, so are we on number 11? List the identifying marks of the little horn as they appear through chapter 7. So the answer in verse 8 was he came up among the ten horns. This little horn power comes up among the ten horns. So it's in that Western Europe area, this little horn power. The Roman Empire divided into ten parts by A.D. 476. That's what I mentioned earlier. Since the little horn emerges, emerges to greatness among these ten divisions, he would have to become a major power after the breakup of the Roman Empire. Thus, we should look for the rise of the little horn in Western Europe after A.D. 476. The little horn plucked up, how many? Three of the horns. Since only seven of the original ten divisions of the Roman Empire are still in existence in Europe today, I kind of mentioned France, England, you know, Germany, those countries like that, um, empire is still in existence in Europe today, obviously the little horn power has already arisen in Western Europe. Letter C. Um, he had eyes like the eyes of a man. This little horn power, so it's gonna. In the mouth, like a man. There's a man at the head of this power. He had a mouth speaking pompous words against the Most High. What was the number B? Letter, 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 two or? letter B? Yeah. 
of 3. Plucked out 3. And you got C. He had eyes. Mm -hmm. And now D, he had a mouth speaking pompous. Words against the most high. This power would blaspheme God. Remember, Belshazzar blasphemed God when he mixed paganism with the worship of God. Obviously, this power would likewise blaspheme God by mixing paganism with the worship of God. Not good. <laughs> Letter E, he was making war against the saints. Now, who are saints? In the Bible, according to the Bible, do we know who the saints are? Is that like St. Paul or St. Stephen or St. Are those the saints? Well, let's go to 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Jen, you want to read that? We can maybe find out who the saints are according to the scripture. So, who are the saints in Jen? Those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. Right. So, if we accept Jesus into our heart, if we confess our sins, and we become saints, then we don't need to be declared a saint. We are saints. All who are Christians, who are believers, are saints. Just like ancient Babylon, the little horn would persecute those who dis, uh, disagreed with its presumptuous claims. It would attempt to destroy the saints of God. Let F, he shall intend to change times and law. The answer there, change. You can't just be given a title of saint, though. You have to earn it, right? Or be... Well, not according to the Bible. It's like you got St. Mary, you got St. Peter, uh, St. Basilicus, I think is the other one. But according to the Bible, that the, the way the Catholic Church set up St. Mary, St. Peter, St. you know, all these saints, yeah. has nothing to do with the Bible. Okay, so it, anybody can be a saint according to the Bible. Absolutely. We are all sinners, right? We're all sinners saved by grace, by the grace of God. Unmerited grace. We cannot earn salvation. No, it's a free gift. That's freely to us. I lost my train of thought there. So, um, God declares who's going to be saints. Those, all saints will be in heaven. Not all sinners are going to be in heaven. All the saints are sinners, right? Yep, right. St. Yeah. Peter, even, even the ones that are called St. Peter or St. John. or I mean, there's a lot of them. There's, not, there's probably just name and names. There's probably a St. Mike, believe it or not. St. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Stephen, well, we know there's a St. Stephen out there. <laughs> There's, <laughs> yeah. I don't think there's any St. Sue's, though, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> or St. Minnie's. I don't know of any St. Mai. I just thought, you know, from what I, I guess from what I knew, there was a process to becoming a saint. Well, there is in the Catholic Church. Yeah, that, that's okay. But not in the Bible. Yeah. Okay. Not, but that's not a biblical thing. Good question, though, because that reminded me of the, some of those things, you know. Um, yeah, we'll, you know. Anyway, so letter F, did we get that answer? Yeah. He shall intend to change the times of the law. 
Changing God's law is unthinkable, and yet this great power would think that it could actually change God's law. Letter G. Shall, okay, it says, uh, this is in, out of verse 25, that it shall be given um, his, into his hand for a time, and times, and half a time. Kind of interesting how the Bible says that, a time, times, and half a time. So that time is actually a year, times is two years, and a half a time is half a year. Just as simple as that. <laughs> okay, number, what is that, 12? What other biblical expressions are used to describe the time of the reign of the little horn? Revelation 12, 14. Justin, you want to read that? But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nursed for a time and time and half a time from the presence of the serpent. See, there's all this imagery, and I won't to this, what does the two wings of a great eagle and that she might fly into the wilderness? Uh, hopefully it'll cover, this will be covered in a later study what that means. Um, but anyways, there we have that um, time, times, and half a time in Revelation 12, 14. Revelation 13, 5. You want to read that? Jenny. And he was given a mouth speaking great things I caught a yawner. <laughs> it wasn't Jenny this time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's getting that more, deeper oxygen. Yeah, it's like, uh, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. That's talking about the little horn power, and it rained for 42 months. Revelation 12, verse 6. says, then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. One, so the answer to C, 1,260 days. This per period is referred to in the scriptures as a time, times, and dividing of time. Time, times, and half a time, 42 months, and 1260 days. Obviously, they all should equal the same time period. 42 months times 30 days in a month would equal 1260 days. A time would equal 360 days according to the Jewish year. The, let's see, two times would be 720 days, and a half a time would be 180 days which totals 1,260 days. Thus, the little horn power would rule over the minds of men for 1,260 days. Remember, in Bible time prophecy, a day equals one literal year, according to Ezekiel 4.6, which we learned early on in Lesson 1. Thus, the little horn power is to rule for 1,260 literal years. So they all 1,260 years, which is the same as 42 months times 30 days, and which also equals that time times and half a time. The little horn and the beast of Revelation. The book of Revelation also reveals the little horn power under different symbolism. In fact, the beast of Revelation 13 and the little horn of Daniel 7 refer to the same power. List the identifying marks of the beast of Revelation 13. So, there again, we're going to read that whole... So you want to read that? Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. 
<clears throat> and I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and this deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and he is was given authority to continue for 42 months. Uh, then he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. All who dwell on the earth will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. He who leads into captivity shall go into captivity. He who kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on earth on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell in the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He was granted power to give breath into the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slaves, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's the wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is six. All right, there was a lot there. So, number 13, let's say identifying marks of the beast of Revelation 13. Letter A, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. The dragon. Who is the dragon? Satan. The dragon represents the devil. Revelation 12, 9, no matter what this power claims, a source authority and power ew, is none other than Satan himself. One of his head is as if it had been mortally wounded. Okay. Yeah. Letter C. The deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled. I hope, and I don't know, because I didn't look forward, didn't take the time to look forward, that we're going to go over um, this a little bit more in the future. How this deadly wound was healed, what happened to this beast. Um, the power would receive a deadly wound, but amazingly it would recover, and all the world would then follow this power. Letter D, they worshipped the beast. This beast, this kingdom would receive worship. The power is a power that re receives worship of men. It is therefore a religious power and not a secular power. He speaks, letter E, he speaks great things and blasphemes. Hmm, not good. What was C? Healed. Or the second part of it. And all the world but that beast. Marvel. Okay, speaks great things and blasphemes. Like Daniel's little horn, this power blasphemes God. Um, 
and in verse 5 it was telling us that he continues 42 months Um, this power reigns the same time that Daniel's little horn reigns 1260 years. He would make war with the saints. He makes war with the saints. Notice again the similarity to Daniel 7.25. He shall persecute the saints or make war with them. The whole world worshipped him. Hmm. Kind of interesting. And letter I, his number equals 666. You guys have all heard of that before, right? 666, mm -hmm. the mark of the beast. What, how does it get 666? We'll go over that okay. in a little bit. Just a quick glance at these identifying marks makes it very clear that Revelation 13 and Daniel 7 are talking about exactly the same power. Two different accounts of the same power. What will ultimately happen to the little horn power? Daniel 7:26. But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and destroy it forever. What will ultimately happen to the little horn power? But the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it until the end. This modern spiritual Babylon will ultimately come under the judgment of God and will be destroyed. Daniel is very clear that this power will ultimately come to its end at the second coming of Christ. How important then that we not be deceived by this power. How did Daniel feel about this revelation? Daniel 7.28. Jan, you want to read that? This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. So his thoughts troubled him a lot. Where's count? Your countenance is kind of like your demeanor. Your it says uh, connotation. Connotation is the word they have there, but so yeah, thoughts. Oh. Cogitations. <laughs> yeah, tell me what cogitations are. <laughs> is that countenance? <laughs> oh, is that what you were asking? What cogitations were? No, I was asking the other one. Like countenance? <laughs> Daniel was deeply disturbed by this revelation. Likewise, you might be disturbed by the things revealed in Daniel 7 and Revelation 13. Remember that everything written here has been written in love. God does, God does not want anyone to be deceived by this great delusion that has taken the whole world captive. That's why in mercy he has sent the warnings of Revelation 13 and Daniel 7. Disturbing and shocking as this revelation may be, God sends to us uh, because he loves us so much. God sends it to us because he loves us so much. So, can you guys tell me who this little horn power is? Who the little horn is? So this little, huh? Daniel. No, this little horn power, oh. this kingdom that rises from the ten... That's what, huh? Huh? You want to give a guess, Mike? Mike Dahl? Anything? You've just been staring like you don't know what's happening, Mike. You know, what is going on? No matter where you are, he's always looking at you. That is interesting. Yeah. I, <laughs> It's kind of scary. That's some serious side eye. <laughs> My flesh is seized. Oh, I know. <laughs> but that's all right, Mike. It's better to be quiet and thought a fool than to 
open your mouth and remove all doubt, right? <laughs> so this, this little horned power, this little horned beast, who comes up out of Europe, rises up, it's small, it's a little beast, a little kingdom. Doesn't, doesn't cover a big area. Europe isn't real big anyways. It would fit inside the United States, wouldn't it? Or at least Western Europe would, if you include Russia and like the Like the honey or the chai? Huh? Um, I think we were talking about this here a uh, couple um, a few lessons ago about the, the Sunnis and the Shiites, I think it was. Shiites, oh yeah, Sunnis. Yeah. And the Shiites, yeah, those are. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if that's. Is that out of Europe? Well, I'm trying to think. Okay. Uh, um, Africa? Yeah. Or e Middle East, Middle yeah. East, yeah. No, a little horn power that rises, speaks blasphemy, all these things. The papacy. The papacy. Papacy. Isn't that, that's got to do with the Pope. Yeah. The Pope, it's his head. It's got eyes. It's yeah. got eyes, speaks mouth. Now, of course. Right out of the yeah, me too. <laughs> Well, the, th the thing is, is I've been to a seminar that's not done like this. I'm just following a script here, you know, type of thing, where you just have a speaker that's kind of speaking all these things, and, and um, it doesn't make, you don't make a lot of friends <laughs> speaking this because there was actually a number of Catholics there that, um, you know, that come to things like this. And they listened to this, and I remember there's an elderly lady there in the 80s, and oh man, she was, she started speaking up in a crowd of maybe several hundred people, you know. Where do you get your information from? It's like, it's right there in the Bible, you know. And she was really ticked off. I remember, and and the, the speaker would start answering her questions, and she just, well, what about this? And I, you know, you say all these things, and you know, she was mad she was Catholic and she revered the Pope and um, you know why did we have the Reformation but if you go through all these things and we'll go over that blue sheet there and it it's, talks about it more explicitly let's just go over it try to go over it quickly here because that tells us pretty much everything Can we finish yeah. and oh what message does Jesus send to those he loves? Revelation 3.19. It says in there, As many as I love, I rebuke. And that's the answer. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That's why I know God loves me so much. Because he says he rebukes and chastens those he loves so that's why he's rebuking you all the time, God. Because yeah. he loves you so much. But he has to stop. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pretty close. <laughs> and he's going, man, if she could would ever learn and figure something out, <laughs> I wouldn't have to rebuke her all the time. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it takes, no matter how many whoopings it takes, Sue. <laughs> yeah, you're <laughs> All of God's messages come with love. Jesus has only given the message of Daniel 7 because he loves you. Number 17, do you, do you desire to respond to Jesus' loving appeal and heed the warning about the little horn power? Hopefully you would write yes in there. So, into the blue sheet there. And it's quarter to 12. Can we get through this in 15 minutes? <laughs> It gets long, doesn't it? That's one thing about Minnie and Sue, you guys don't do those big long yawns. And even Jen hasn't been yawning. Mike, he just kind of has a dazed look. And Both was, Mikes, Mike Dahl and Mike Sharp. And he was trying to hide it over here with his head down. <laughs> I, <laughs> like you couldn't see. I saw it. Okay, so reading on the blue sheet there. 
The points of identification examined in this lesson from 7, Daniel 7, Revelation 13, make it clear that this little horn power would arise in Western Europe after the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. It would mix paganism with Christianity. It would command people to worship it. Therefore, it would be a religious power. Um, interesting. I, was, I should have brought some pictures there. But when people come up to the Pope, and if they're not a president or something, what do they deal? What do they do? When they, well, a lot of times the presidents will. But you go up to the Pope and you kneel before the Pope. Kneeling is a sign of worship. That's definitely worship. If you study worship in the Bible, the biggest thing is kneeling. Muslims do have a lot of some things right. They always bow down and to worship God. Um, it would command, let's see, number two, it would command people to worship it. Uh, therefore, it would be a religious power. It would persecute those who dis, uh, disagreed with it. The Dark Ages. You've heard of the Dark Ages, right? Um, Pope John Paul made an apology for all the deaths that they, all the killing that they did throughout the Dark Ages. Um, why do they call it the Dark Ages? Because only the papal power had the scriptures. It was against the law to have the Bible in those times. You couldn't even read for yourself. Except but then we... Sure the scriptures were only in Latin as well, so even if you got a copy, you couldn't read it. You couldn't read it. You couldn't read it. And the services were in Latin a lot of times. Yeah, well, some of them still are. And some still are. So you go, would be great if I spoke Hmong to all you people here? Oh, hey, yeah. we're going to have a Bible study and I'm going to speak Hmong. It's just like, now you think this is boring. Yeah. <laughs> Try to sit here through that. Um, it would persecute those who disagreed with it. So we knew that. They um, killed off many people. Sometimes it wasn't them doing it. They would hire the people to do it, to do the killing. Um, it would blaspheme the God of heaven. That's pretty serious, blaspheme. How does it blaspheme? Um, there's a number of different things. Um, the, 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 that's God speaking to us now. <laughs> Trying to get... Yeah. Oh. Um, what are some ways of, of blaspheming? Uh, what, well, we're going to, huh? Swearing and talking. Um, well, cursing God. You know. In talking ill of talking Ill people, um, you know, sinning, like lying to people. Um, forgiving sins? Claiming the power to forgive sins. Claiming the, the Pope and the, the priest. You can go and confess your sins to them, and what do they say? You have been forgiven. But isn't That's blasphemy, like, talking bad about? Okay. Um, blasphemy is something that you're saying But he was. Well, he is. Yeah. And, yeah. But that's when they said it was blasphemous. And then why that, that he was putting himself in the place of God, yeah. and they didn't believe that he was. And that's when the Catholic Church says that the priest and the Pope forgive your sins, and and that is saying that they have the power of God to forgive sins, and only. Number five, it would rain for 1260 years. Well, we should be going over that in a lesson coming up, um, how long that rain is. It would receive a deadly wound and recover from it and have all the world worship it at once again. We're going to, the, the papacy actually, um, well, lost power in 1798. 
and we should be going over that in the future. Um, but they lost power and it was restored to them by Mussolini, I think it was, in um, 1929 or something, where they were given power again. Number six, it would re oh, receive a deadly wound and uh, recover from it and have all the world worship it once again. Its boldest claim would be um, that it had changed the times and the law. We're going to go over that in the next couple lessons. We can take these marks of identification, go to any encyclopedia or history book, examine the history of the Dark Ages when the Bible said this power would arise, and we would discover that there is only one power that meets every one of these identifying marks. That power is a papacy. Please remember that we are not talking about the people who belong to this system. We are talking about a system that has arisen in opposition to God. There are many good, sincere people in the papacy who love and serve Jesus. God loves them. And in mercy, he has sent them this warning so that they might not be deceived by this power. Let's re-examine the identifying marks of Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 and see how clearly the papacy has met every one of these marks of identification. Um, is there anyone ha have any German in them? German descent? Sue? Mm -hmm. So, just because you're not full-blooded German, I mean, whatever, but you're, you've got some. I think I do have a little bit of German on my grandma's side in me, but if you were a full-blooded German person and you were here from Germany, we don't hold the Holocaust against them, do we? You know, that's one thing that I have a hard time. Just because you're American, you know, and we can be proud of being American, but that doesn't mean that um, just because, you know, our country has done a lot of bad things to many different countries and many different, you know, we used to have slavery in, in this country. And slavery is wrong. And, you know, of course, now in our day and age, we're talking about, um, what is that called again? Huh? Reparations. Reparations, yeah. You know, oh, we got to pay the people, you know, what happened, you know, two centuries ago. Now the descendants, you know, oh, we got we to gotta give them reparations. And I would like to say, well, <laughs> I'm giving them reparations. I'm working my tail off, so <laughs> a lot of those people are, don't have to do nothing. That's a little bit of a political statement there, but oh well. But it, it just makes me sick. It makes me sick what we're doing to, I, I hate to say it, but what we're doing to the black people of this country. We're saying, poor you, poor you, poor you, you know. Everything that bad's happened because, you know, your great, 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 great grandpa was, a, yeah. could have been, could have, might have been a slave. That your fathers, that those great, that their parents sold them off to white people. I get so sick of that baloney. And it's just like I'm sitting here slaving away and working and whatever so that, oh, you know. It's like, man, they do get all the freebies. Not all of them. There's a lot of hard-working people in every... But it's in all, uh, it's in all different nationalities. Exactly. Like, say you say something to a person that is Hmong, yeah. and the first thing they jump up with is racism. Yeah. Or you're yeah. holding that against me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's been, I've been called a racist several times. No. Only when I became a landlord. But. Yeah, isn't that just nice? Yeah. Where was I at? We were on A of the second page. Okay. So it arose among the ten divisions. As the Roman Empire divided into ten divisions, another power emerged as the unifying power among all the ten divisions of the Roman Empire. The power was the papacy. No other such power arose among the ten divisions of the Roman Empire at that time. It plucks up three horns. As the papal power emerged among the ten divisions of the Roman Empire, there were three powers that refused to submit to the Bishop of Rome. They were the Heruli, the Vandals, and the Ostrogoths. To achieve full unity, the papacy encouraged armies to destroy these three powers. Indeed, three horns were plucked up. The last of those horns was destroyed in A.D. 538. It had eyes uh, like the eyes of a man. At the head of the papacy sits a man making the decisions that affect the lives and the souls of thousands of people. 
It had a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. He committed blasphemy, according to the scripture. Blasphemy consists of three things. This is what you were asking, right, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> Daniel 5 indicated that it is blasphemy to mix uh, together paganism and Christianity. As pagans came flooding into the church in those early centuries, the papacy changed the pure doctrines of early Christianity. It tried to make it easier for the pagans to adjust to Christianity by incorporating pagan practices into the Christian faith. For example, the pagans were used to worshiping gods and goddesses, whereas Christians worshipped only one god. Therefore, the church introduced a practice of praying to the saints. Praying to the saints. This took the place of the household gods of paganism making it easier for these unconverted pagans who had entered the church to adjust to Christianity. In addition, Christianity had no female deity, so the papacy elevated Mary to take the place of Jesus Christ as the only mediator between God and man. And you can look, if you want, later on, 1 Timothy 2.5. There were many other pagan practices that Rome Christianized during this period. We all know that, saying the rosary, right? Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and to the hour of our death. And Holy Mary, Mother of God. That's not biblical. It's not biblical, but it's what they do. It's what they practice. It's like the person that cuts the ham off the stone. Why do they do that? Well, we don't know why we do it. <laughs> We all have a different purpose for that. We are told in various ways by Eusebius that Constantine, I believe he was the first pope, in order to recommend the new religion to it, the outward ornaments by which they had been accustomed in their own. It is not necessary to go into a subject which the diligence of Protestant writers has made familiar to most of us. The use of temples and these dedicated to particular saints. And ornamented on occasions with branches of trees, incense, lamps, and candles. Votive from illnesses, holy water, asylums, holy days in seasons, use of calendars, processions, blessings on the fields, sacerdotal vestments, the tonsure, the ring in marriage. Hmm, interesting. The ring in marriage had pagan roots. <laughs> Turning to the east, images at a later date, perhaps the ecclesiastical chant and the Kyrie Lyson are all of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the church. You know, it mentioned their holy days and seasons. Um, Christmas, where did that originate with? Easter, how did that originate from? Um, you know, back in the days, in the Christians, the early Christians, in the Jewish people, they had the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast, all those different feasts that they would celebrate. That got changed in the Christian realm. Now we celebrate things like Christmas. Well, that was a pagan holiday. Easter was a pagan holiday. So, is it wrong to celebrate Christmas? Well, I don't know. Um, can we prop that door open, Justin? You wanna? I feel like it's getting smoky and hot. Yeah, it's getting. Right. Well, we're getting on fire here. We're um, throw us in the pit. Uh, number two there. Uh, if you guys, if you have the internet and you look in and want to search those all those different things up, um, how basically the church, the Catholic Church, started a lot of those. Um, Number two, blasphemy uh, is for a man to claim that he can forgive sins. Mark 2, 7. Oh, I was going to have that put on the screen and I didn't. Is anyone can pull up Mark 2, 7 quick? Notice the claim of the papacy to be able to forgive men of their sins. That's what I just talked about a little bit earlier. That you can go to the priest a Catholic priest, and he will forgive you of your sins. Does anyone have Mark 2, 7? Did you get that, Julie? Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> that works. Read it. Uh, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So that was speaking of Jesus. That's where the um, um, Pharisees, yeah, were trying to trap Jesus. Like, he's just a mere man, and he's saying he can forgive sins. Yeah, well, Jesus was. To abide by the judgment of his priest and either uh, not to pardon or to pardon according as they refuse to give absolution, provided the penitent is capable of duties and dignities of the priest by Ligoria. Um, number 27, or letter B. I'm sorry, letter B. I know they threw. Oh, page 27, that was out of that. Never mind. Letter B. Were the Redeemer to descend into a church and sit in a confessional to administer the sacrament of penance, and a priest to sit in a confessional, Jesus would say over each penitent, Ego te absolvo. The priest would likewise say over each of his penitents, Ego te absolvo. The penitents of each would be equally absolved. So, so a repentant sinner going to a priest to ask for forgiveness. We don't have to go to a priest. We can just go right to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. Oh, and also ask forgiveness if we've sinned against somebody else. Let us see. The priest holds, in the, place, holds the place of the Savior himself when by saying, Ego te absolvo, he absolves from sin. Blasphemy is to claim the prerogatives of God. Hence, priests are called the parents of Jesus Christ. Such is the title that St. Bernard gives them. For they are the active causes by which he is made to exist really in the consecrated host. Um, thus a priest may in certain manner be called the creator of his creator, since by saying the words of consecration he creates, as it were, Jesus in the sacrament. All names which in the scripture are applied to Christ by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church. All the same names are applied to the Pope on the authority of councils. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty, the great encyclical letters of Leo the 13th, page here four. Letter E, thou art the shepherd, thou art the physician, thou art the director, thou art the husbandman. Finally, thou art another God on earth. So, the Pope claiming to act as God. Those are all quotes from Catholic writings and councils, you think? Uh, right from the Catholic Church. When one examines the Roman Catholic quotation cited, there can be no question that the papi, papacy has spoken great words against the Most High, blasphemed God, and combined paganism with Christianity. Letter E, he makes war with the saints. More people were killed by the papacy during the Dark Ages than by Hitler in World War II. That the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. History of the rise and the influence of rationalism. That's where that came from. Uh, another uh, Catholic um, quotation. <laughs> Letter F, think to change times and laws. The next two lessons will detail how the Roman, and Roman church has accomplished this. Letter G, to reign for 1260 years. The papacy had established its power in AD 538 when the last of the three powers was subdued. The decree of the Justinian, of Justinian making the pope's head of the church and corrector of heretics issued in AD 533 took effect in 538 when no power stood in the way of the Pope having full supremacy. Exactly 1260 years later in 1798, Bert Bertier, the French general under Napoleon, invaded the Vatican and took the Pope prisoner, ending the temporal sovereignty of the Pope. His long reign lasted exactly 1260 years. Kind of interesting. That's what the Bible told us, right? You had a G? Huh? I did not have a G. I didn't need an F. No G. I don't 
Maybe Mike took it. Just that extra little sheet of paper. It's right here. Oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah, number what in the page number is it? Five? Identification marks from Revelation, uh, starting with A, it received its power seat and great authority from the dragon, from the devil. Mmm. Ouch. How come you got so many names? Lucifer, Satan, the devil? Who's going to make up their names? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Jesus has many names, too. Yeah. He is the great I Am. The dragon primarily represents Satan. However, the devil works through various agencies. In this case, pagan Rome. The Roman emperors moved the capital of the Roman Empire from Rome to Constantinople, thereby leaving the Pope the chief power in the West. They put the power of the Caesars behind the Bishop of Rome, thereby elevating him above all the other bishops in Christianity. Truly, pagan Rome gave the papacy his power, seat, and great authority. It received a deadly wound when Berthier, the French general, took the Pope prisoner in 1798. You guys didn't know that, did you? Mm -hmm. Neither did I before I looked. He inflicted the deadly wound. Many thought the papacy had come to its end and could never recover. Indeed, it had received a deadly wound. The deadly wound was healed. In 1929, Mussolini once again restored the Vatican to the Pope, making him again a secular as well as a religious ruler. Today, the Vatican is recognized by many governments on earth. Even the United States of America sends an ambassador to the Vatican, recognizing the Vatican state as a secular as well as a religious state. As one observes the developing papacy today, one sees, indeed, the whole world wandering after this power. D, people worship this power. Only One only has to watch the acts of obeisance that people pay to the head of the papacy to know that this power is an object of reverence and worship. During his 1260 year reign, few earthly governments dared to defy this power. He held the keys to life and death for thousands of individuals. E, it spoke great words and blasphemy. It was to reign for 42 months. It made war with the saints. All the world worships it today for fulfillment Fulfillment of the above four marks of identification. C points D, E, and G under Daniel 7 in this exhibit. Letter I, it has a number that, okay, in Revelation, it talks about the 666. Notice that Revelation 13, 18 does not say that, say the number 666 is written out. Rather, it, has, it says that to discover the number of the beast, one must count the number of the beast or add it up. An ancient custom was to use a Roman numeral system on people's names, adding up the various totals of the letters. That would then be the person's number. The Bible says the beast has a number, and the numbers add up to 666. One of the official titles of the head of the Roman church in Latin is Vicarius Filidae, meaning Vicar of the Son of God. Please notice below that the numerical value of the letters of this of his name add up to the biblical 666. So the papacy fits the six point. Is that the end? Good, because that's where I come to the end. Is that interesting to you guys at all? Or? Never heard that before. Um, I didn't think anybody did. Well, and I always, I knew growing up, growing up, that <laughs> some of the, the worst kids, we, I grew up in a more of a Lutheran community, but we still had a couple Catholics, a few Catholics in there, and boy, they were the most foul mouthed people <laughs> you could run into. <laughs> and, you know, and stuff like that. You know, it was like, you, know, you just sin, sin, sin. You know, I don't know if they're doing it right now or if it's maybe done. What do they do down in New Orleans? What is that called again? Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. Did they have Mardi Gras? Oh, yeah. You know, and all these Catholics go down. Well, it's not just Catholics, of course. It's all people. You go out there, and Mardi Gras is a celebration of what? Wicked, doing wicked and evil things, right? And it just supposedly is a Christian. 
Christian thing leading up to Lent, but that is not how Mardi Gras celebrates well, right. at all. It's party hardy because, yeah. Party hardy because now you're going to have Ash Wednesday and Lent. And then up until, and it ends at Ash Wednesday, right? And two, yeah, Fat Tuesday. Or Shrove Fat Tuesday, Tuesday get in all your sins. Get, get everything done, confess your sins quick, because Ash Wednesday is tomorrow, and then we have Lent. And Can't then. afford to lose the revenue now. Yeah. Well, and it's so interesting because the money that the papacy oh, has is crazy. I mean, who's always got the biggest, when you look at the most expensive, fanciest churches in town? Catholic. It's always a Catholic church. You go to Marshall, I mean, right. these buildings, to build them now with all brick and stuff, and I, we were traveling and, and just, just for a fun little trip, to look at Christmas lights, we went to New Alm. If you ever have a chance to go look at the Catholic Church in New Alm, that is, it is spectacular. I, I, I never hardly ever darkened the door of a Catholic church. Oh, was it Sleepy Eye? I said New Alm. I'm sure New Alm has a magnificent... Huh? I put air conditioning in that church. Really? Is it pretty amazing inside, too? It's amazing, a real nook and cranny that is tucked into the chest of the non handy job. That's got some really neat old stuff over there from the medical days because basically the doctors back then were the, the priests or whatever, but they got all the kinds of displays, cases full of stuff. Yeah, and Sleepy Eye, yeah, that, that Catholic church, I mean, you just you should drive, you know, it's like they're like museums and it's all brick and the steeples yeah, that reach that to... down by the lake there for the nuns to have their retreats and stuff. It's a show and staff, they call it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I remember uh, driving by that. And I worked out at the school sisters in Notre Dame, too, in Mankato, up in the hill there where they retired. But that's not a big brick complex. And I don't know. I don't think of Catholic people as being a real generous people. <laughs> Give me. But they just had so many people. Yeah. It's. But they also they pay penances. They do things like that to. Try indulgences. To yeah. Indulgences to try and buy a spot in heaven for loved ones that have died. Yeah. So that. Big I'm telling you, we're gonna we're gonna learn a lot more of what this system has done and a lot of the pagan practices and stuff. When they put everything in kneeling church, who are they kneeling? Are they kneeling for God or are they kneeling for the preacher? Well, <laughs> I don't think the people know what they're kneeling for <laughs> most of the time. All right. Let's close with word of prayer. Julie, can I get you to close with a word of prayer? Dear Lord, I thank you for this day and the warmer weather that we've been having. I thank you for this day off that we can learn more about what the Bible says and then um, some of us may even be able to spend time outside enjoying the weather you've given us. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to learn and understand what these lessons are teaching so that we can grow closer to you. I pray that you'll bless this food, that you will be with us in our uh, visiting afterwards, Lord, and that you will be with us for the rest of the day as well. Amen. 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 Amen.